In a nutshell, getting a high score on the math section essentially comes down to knowing the right concepts, knowing the right rules, and having the right formulas memorized. But if it's your first time studying for the SAT, you're not really sure if you have mastered and memorized all the formulas that are tested. That's why in this video, I'm going to share the complete list of 12 formulas you need to know before your next SAT. If it's your first time here, my name is John. I've been an SAT math tutor for the past 11 years, and my specialty is taking a student who's currently in four, five, six hundred range to 700 plus by their next SAT. And this video is actually one of the lectures from the Accelerator program. But with the SAT coming up and SAT getting harder every single exam, thought you guys would need it as well. And every single formula you need to know, and we're going to go over in this video, is going to be nicely organized into a four page PDF, which you can download and print out and get your own copy using the pinned comment down below. And a quick disclaimer is that this video was designed for students who had already gone through weeks one through five and mastered all the concepts that are going to be tested on the SAT. They have seen all of these formulas before, and this is going to be just a quick refresher. So instead of going very deep on each one of these concepts, instead, we're going to lightly touch on what the formula looks like, what you need to memorize, and show you what these questions look like and how you use it on these questions. And we're going to end it with the insights you need to have for every one of these formulas. So with all that being said, let's get straight into it. If you guys have any questions, leave it in the comments down below, and hope you enjoy. What's up, guys? Great job for finishing weeks one through five and mastering the concepts. Now we're going to do some practice exams and get you ready for the real thing. But before we do that, we want to make sure you have the right concepts in place, right formulas and right rules in your head. That way you'll be ready to go rock and roll and get a 700 plus on your next SAT. So let's go to the first formula. So how it's going to work is I'm going to show you what the formula is, what it looks like on the SAT. But if you're kind of feeling shaky and you want to touch up on it one more time, just simply click this link here and it's going to take you to the lecture summary, speed training practices and everything you would need. So let's get started. So first one is going to be the percent change formula, which is used to find the percent increase or decrease from one number to the next. And the formula is going to be final minus initial over initial times 100. And the result is going to show you the percent change if it's positive, increase, negative, decrease. And how does it look? You have seen this question before. You have 27 cookies and you're left with 13 pieces. What was the percent decrease? Well, it went from 27 to 13. So final minus initial over initial times 100. Get your answer that way. And on top of the percent change formula, guys, you want to understand how to use the equation method because with the SAT's trend nowadays, it seems like they're moving towards the equation method based questions. So have the percent change formula and also have the equation method in the back pocket. That way you'll be 100% prepared Ready to go. Next is going to be the x intercepts, roots, and zeros. So when it comes to a quadratic function, when it comes to a parabola, roots are a big factor on the SAT. And you want to be equipped with two ways to find the x intercepts for a parabola. First way is just a simple method of factoring. When numbers are clean, simple, and easy to work with, you factor it out and get it that way. But if the numbers are looking nasty, big, and disgusting, and the equation is just not factorable, then you use the quadratic formula, which is minus b plus minus radical b squared minus 4ac over 2a. You pop it in there, get your roots that way. And also you don't want to forget whenever you're working with a quadratic function and you're looking for roots and it shows radicals in the answer choices, immediate trigger for using quadratic function. It tells you that this equation the question gives you is not going to be factorable. So do not waste your time trying to factor it. Next is going to be the sum and product of the roots formula. So sometimes SAT is going to ask you to find the roots individually, or they're going to ask you to find it together as in what's the product of the roots, right? And if they are asking for sum or product, don't bother factoring because the equation is not going to be factorable, go straight into the sum or the product formula, which is going to be right here. And occasionally students ask, John, I get confused on whether the sum is minus B over A or the product is minus B over A. How can I not get confused on this? Just review 6,000 more times and you'll be good to go. Come on, you can do that. Next is going to be the vertex formula. So vertex, another popular thing on the SAT, there are two ways to find them. The first method is quick and simple, minus B over 2A. You use this when the question gives you the equation. That way you know what the B is and what the A is. But if the question does not give you the equation and it's asking you to find the vertex, then you use the midpoint method because the vertex is always going to be located where? Right in between the two x-intercepts. Okay. And you use the midpoint formula to find the middle location. Now let's go to the vertex form and standard form. So the SAT is going to ask you to put a quadratic function into a vertex form or standard form. You want to be familiar with the vertex form structure, which is a parentheses x minus h squared plus k and h and k represents what? They represent the location of the vertex. And on the SAT, it's going to give you a quadratic function and it's going to ask you to represent the minimum maximum vertex of the parabola as constant or coefficient. And we know that the vertex form shows you the location of the vertex as constants, because by looking at H and K, you know exactly where the vertex is. So our answer is going to be choice D. Don't get confused on the structure. Make sure you do negative H and positive K. Don't get confused on that. For this example right here, your H is going to be minus two and your K is going to be negative 16. That way it turns out like that when you plug it into the vertex form. Now let's talk about discriminants. On the SAT, discriminants are very popular. There are two usages 
this you need to understand. First one is to find the number of routes or number of X intercepts for a parabola because it could have what? Zero solution, one root or two roots. It really depends on the parabola and you can use discriminants to find out the number of roots. So for example, gives you a parabola right here. How many roots does the function above have or how many X intercepts does the function above have? Or if it's set equal to zero, how many solutions does the function above have? You use discriminant. When your Y is set equal to zero, you're essentially looking at X intercepts. Now, the second usage of discriminant is going to be finding the number of intersections between a line and a parabola. The question is going to give you a line parabola and it's asking how many intersections do the functions above have? You combine the equations, pop into discriminants, look at the results and find out how many intersections there are like so. Okay. Next, let's talk about SOHCAHTOA. SOHCAHTOA obviously comes from sine opposite hypotenuse, cosine adjacent hypotenuse, tangent opposite adjacent. Make sure you set it up like so. Some people forget about the angle here or forget about the equal sign. Don't forget that. For SOHCAHTOA, you have to have the angle and the two side length set up like so. And the critical thing you need to understand is that SOHCAHTOA on the SAT, when it tells you sine of 40 is 4 fifth, it's actually telling you not the actual side length. 4 is not the opposite. 5 is not the hypotenuse. 4 fifth is essentially the simplified version of of the actual side length. Four over five is just the ratio. So to find the actual side length, set up the ratio and find the actual side length and set them equal to each other. Four over five is equal to opposite eight over H, cross multiply, get your answer that way. And always remember what the questions gives you is most likely going to be the ratio. It has been the actual side lengths in the past, but more than like 85% of the times, it's been the ratio. Make sense? Cool. Now, next thing about trig is going to be the complementary rule. You have seen this equation before. You want to have that drilled into your head. And the most important thing is when sine, cosine are set that equal to each other, that means their angles sum up to 90. Sine and cosine set equal to each other, they add up to 90. Sine and cosine set equal to each other, their angles add up to 90. That's the definition of the complementary rule. And it only works when sine and cosine are set equal to each other. If it's like sine of 30 minus cosine of x minus 20 is equal to zero, then you want to move it to the other side first and then set them equal to each other. And you're right, you don't really have to move it. You can just apply the complementary rule in this case and add them up like so, but SAT is gonna come up with some kind of variation and you wanna be prepared for it. So just do it right the first time and you will have no trouble. Next, let's talk about circles. The two main formulas are going to be the sector area and the arc length formula, which is going to be right here. You definitely wanna understand and memorize it. It's really simple. Sec arc length is just circumference times proportion. Sector area is just total area times proportion. And the main takeaway is that the angle over 360 represents what? The fraction or proportion represented by the circle. And what does angle over 360 represent? It shows the fraction or portion of the circle that is represented by the arc or the sector. So if the question is asking something like this sector is what part or what fraction of the whole circle, you can find the area of the sector and area of the whole circle and get it that way. Or you can just use this concept and just do 140 over 360. And your answer is going to be 14 over 36 or simply just seven over 18 like so. Make sense? Cool. Get the formula, know the inside and let's move on. Next thing is going to be the equation of the circle on the coordinate plane. When it comes to these types, you want to understand how this equation works. And you also want to understand how to complete the square. And you you also want to understand what it means for a point to be inside the circle, outside the circle, and on the circle. Check out the circle lecture for the details. And you also want to understand how to use the distance formula, which is used to find a distance between two coordinates. So for example, 2, 3, minus 2, 7. Sometimes people can just draw it out and then use Pythagorean theorem to find the answer. But I personally think it's easier and quicker to just use the distance formula, especially when the numbers get big and complicated. And with the trend of SAT nowadays, questions are getting harder. So it's best to have the distance formula in your back pocket if the Pythagorean theorem really doesn't work out. And lastly, it's going to be the area and the volume formulas you need to know for the SAT. And students often say, John, I get all of these formulas. I don't really need to memorize them. But guys, listen, SAT is all about solving questions correctly and quickly. You want to save time as much as possible. You don't want to go back and forth between the formula sheet to figure out, okay, what was the formula again? You don't want to do that. That's how you get 400 on the math section. Instead, you want to have all these formulas in the back of your head so that when the time comes, you're ready to go. And the level you want to get to is you want to get to the formula within two, three seconds. For example, if somebody asks you, hey, how do you find volume of a sphere? And you go, mm, you just got rejected from your school. The key is to say it within two, three seconds. Sphere, four over three, pi or cube. Cylinder, pi or squared, height. Pyramid, one over three, length with height. Like you want to you wanna say it as quickly as possible. And you can do that by going through the speed training in the volumes chapter. Also, in addition to the provided formulas, you want to memorize the area for parallelogram and the hexagon. They were proven to be helpful. And that's pretty much every formula you need to know. If you got everything in here, you should be good. You're not going to miss any question because you forgot what the formula was. Up next, let's go over every single rule you need to know for the SAT. That's a more important thing. Make sure you get these straightened out. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment down below and I'll see you in the next lecture.